So one early morning, I was sleeping in my bed, paralyzed, unable to move or speak. It was really weird because, you know, I was sleeping, but awake, you know, wakeful at the same time. I could see my surroundings. I could see the sort of ceiling, the walls, the poster on my wall. Like I was actually awake, but my physical body was, you know, paralyzed. I was actually paralyzed. I couldn't move. Uh, you know, and, and then I felt like, you know, at the same time that there, there was this creature, this vicious, evil being, you know, something really, really evil in my bedroom. And this feeling got stronger and stronger and stronger until this, I felt like this vicious creature was on my bed, strangling me, choking me, you know, trying to kill me. And then I saw my legs flying up and down like this, you know, I saw, you know, and I was just like, what do I do? And so I eventually got out of the state. I wrestled myself out of the state. I woke up and I was like, what do I do? Like, do I go tell my parents? You know, I, at the time I wasn't a very uh, good studious kid. You know, I straight out of high school, but you know, I didn't have a good track record. So I couldn't really go to my parents and say, I saw a ghost in my, in my bedroom. You know, what do I do? Go, I couldn't tell my friends either, right? Because it sounded crazy. Uh, do I Google this? Like I saw a ghost, like how do I, what do I Google exactly? And where do I find the results? You know, this was a, you know, uh, over a decade ago, it was many, many years ago. So, you know, at that time it was even, there was less information on this kind of stuff, you know? So this was an episode of sleep paralysis and it took me on a long journey to understand what sleep paralysis is, why we have paralysis during sleep and see these uncanny ghosts why we, we become a you know ghost ourselves and have out of body experiences during these you know episodes now sleep paralysis as our research shows occurs during one of the stages of sleep known as rem sleep rapid eye movement sleep right so your eyes are moving like this uh, and rem sleep occurs during one of the stages of sleep where you have vivid and lifelike and crisp dreams so these are the dreams where you see yourself on the moon, sort of wrestling with an alligator, having tea with the queen, and at the same time you're playing soccer for Liverpool. You know, everything is just messed up, like time, places, people, everything is mixed. So these are REM dreams and your brain is clever. So there are structures in the, the lower part of the brain, the, in the pons and medulla, that's responsible for inhibiting movement and allowing you to dream safely in effect, right? So in order for you not to act out your, you know, your dreams, uh, you know, and hurting yourself and your sleeping partner, your brain will literally, you know, paralyze you during this REM stage of sleep. A very smart thing. Now, by the way, the reason, the reason why dreams are so bizarre and strange is also because of the brain. There's a part of the brain known as the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is it's a fancy name for uh, a structure, a cluster of cells that, you know, cells that is responsible for, uh, you know, creating a cohesive, logical and, you know, um, weave together reality. And when that part of the brain uh, is turned off, as it is during dreams, then dreams have this bizarre and strange reality to them. Okay, so let's go to, back to sleep paralysis here. So sleep paralysis occurs out of REM sleep, meaning when you are paralyzed and having these bizarre and lifelike dreams and the, you know, the cortical regions of your brain, right? So the regions of the brains, your brain that's responsible for wakefulness start becoming activated prematurely such that, you know, you are starting to become mentally awake, but you're still paralyzed in REM, right? So you have this uh, premature wakefulness occurring on top of your REM sleep, so your REM, you're still in REM paralyzed, but you're waking up. And so this decoupling of wakefulness uh, from REM sleep causes uh, the dream world and the, the, the wakefulness world to collide in, in this head-on collision, right? So these two worlds meet, and I know of no other uh, phenomena in science where uh, you have a clash of parallel universes like this. So it's quite the experience, sleep paralysis. Now, in our research in six or seven countries, we found that depending on where you live and the cultural ideas you have for sleep paralysis, well, that can affect the experience in profound and unique ways, right? So in Egypt, for example, we discovered that sleep paralysis among Egyptians, among many Egyptians, is understood as evil genies that attacks you, chokes you, can potentially kill you. So evil genies, the genies of like the cartoon Aladdin, you know, the, 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 the living lambs and stuff, you know, terrifying creatures 
can do all the stuff to you. So there's this elaborate, uh, you know, dense, culturally very rich idea for what sleep paralysis is. Now, in places like Italy, in the Abruzzo region, we did research and found that, you know, you have about, you know, one third of Italians saying that sleep paralysis may be caused by this creature known as the Pandafica, which is a giant uh, cat or witch-like creature as it comes at night, does all these vicious things to you, may even kill you. Quite terrifying. Now, by contrast, in places like Denmark, in places like Poland, we discovered that no, sleep paralysis is merely understood as the brain, as anxiety, as stress. So there you have it, you know, depending on where you live in the world, your ideas about sleep paralysis can vary profoundly, drastically in, in these cases. And I thought to myself, look, sleep paralysis is next level, right? So my sleep paralysis was just indistinguishable from reality when I had that. It was just so vivid, it was so crisp, I was encountering this ghost. And I thought, well, if you understand that from a certain cultural lens, then surely it will affect the way that your whole physiology and your, your, your ideas about it, you know, uh, that, mu that must be affected by your cultural ideas, you know. It can't be that, you know, you know this, this very uh, lifelike experience is, is, it must be affected by your cultural uh, notions. And so we did, you know, comparison, you know, research, cross-cultural research, where we compared sleep paralysis in Egypt, right, where it's understood, you know, where many, I think it was like 95% of people said, well, look, this is supernatural. And then we compared it to uh, Denmark, where most people said, no, it's just the brain, and said, look, how is it different depending on your cultural ideas? And it turned out, if you had these cultural ideas, if you said it was like these ghosts and, and, and genies and stuff, then you ended up having sleep paralysis much more frequently. So an Egyptian would have it three times more common, you know, frequently than a Danish person with sleep paralysis. They would have longer paralysis or they would per perceive this paralysis to last much longer. And then finally, they would also have great fear. In Egypt, they would have fear to the extent that, I think like 50% of people would say, look, I might die from this, you know, so quite the thing. So definitely, depending on where you lived in the world, it had this major mind-body-like effect where the experience itself, you know, was changing, you know, it was becoming much more frequent and salient, right? The fact that you would say it lasts longer, that it happens more frequently. And then we discover that it also potentially led you to have anxiety and maybe like clinical anxiety come from this and maybe trauma traumatic, like, you know, trauma-like symptoms emerge from these these experiences, and this was quite fascinating. Um, this would be an example of what is known as the placebo effect, or actually, sorry, the nocebo effect. You have the placebo effect, right? I give you a pill, I say you will, you know, become uh, stronger at running, and I give you a sugar pill, and lo and behold, you actually become stronger because of your brain, you know, convincing your body that, you know, that this was actually something uh, useful, even though it was just sugar. Now, the nocebo is the opposite, all right? So it's the placebo's evil twin. I give you a pill, so you will die from it, and the pill is sugar, and you react to it, okay? So this is the nocebo effect. So let me illustrate this nocebo-like effect using the example of little Lisa. So imagine this girl, uh, little Lisa, she lives on this fictitious island far away, and during dinner, her grandmother will say, look, there's this monster. It comes at night. You know, it chokes you. It can kill you. You're paralyzed, unable to move, you know, and it looks like this and that, you know, and little Lisa's terrified. She goes to bed and she experiences sleep paralysis for the first time in her life. Okay, interesting. She wakes up the next day, she's terrified and scared, and two or three days later, she has sleep paralysis again. And then a couple of days later, she has it again and again and again, and it turns out a month later, sleep paralysis for Lisa has become chronic, you know, and it has become petrified. Uh, you know, she's petrified and terrified, you know, of what's happening to her, and she might have developed anxiety, chronic anxiety, and maybe even trauma from this. So what's going on? What's happening in Lisa's brain? Well, we think what's going on here is, first of all, because of the ideas planted in her brain by her grandmother, she went to bed terrified. And so, so she had nocturnal arousal, the amygdala, the limbic parts of the brain, the emotional parts of the brain being hyperactive, okay? 
flaring up during the REM stage, causing her to wake up mentally during REM and have sleep paralysis for the first time, right? So this is the direct role of these ideas planted in her head by her grandmother. Second, she will start to monitor any paralysis sensations, mind you, unconsciously, but she will monitor any creatures holding her down, anything pressing on her chest, right? So she will unconsciously start monitoring all kinds of sort of paralysis sensations. And then when she wakes up during sort of REM, half, half uh, sort of waking up and she feels, oh, she's paralyzed, she, something is holding her down, she will wake up fully and sort of it becomes a conformatory behavior like that. Really creepy, but this is, what we, this is what we think is going on. Third, when she then sees a ghost, when she sees a monster, when she sees whatever, you know, hallucinations, you know, that hallucination will be tainted and colored by the cultural ideas planted in her brain, in her mind, by her grandmother. So this would be remnantation, dream imagery, you know, spilling over into her waking consciousness and painting her experience such that she sees the ghost exactly as her grandmother was telling her, okay? And then when she wakes up, the next day she's terrified and scared and that fear and anxiety feeds on itself, causing more nighttime anxiety and more nighttime fear, you know? And she, she wakes up the second and the third day and has more sleep paralysis, causing more fear and nighttime anxiety, nocturnal arousal, causing sleep paralysis to become frequent and chronic and then of course a week or two later she'll go my god this is personal it's not merely an attack it's a, I'm, I'm possessed by this by this creature and she develops potentially chronic anxiety potentially even ptsd where each of these episodes at night becomes small traumas small t's you know building up causing this major potential trauma so this is some of our research indicates this uh, that this might be a potential possibility and then beyond that, little Lisa goes and, and tells her friends in school and says, look, there's this monster and it attacks me. It looks like this and that. And they start having sleep paralysis and go down this roller coaster. And this is where, you know, this is where we found, you know, we found that if, you know, Egyptians have sleep paralysis, you know, generally twice, uh, you know, it's twice as common in Egypt compared to places like Denmark. So, it's, it's interesting how you have this, you know, thing changing in these drastic ways. So this is the crux of our research for the past uh, 10 years across, uh, uh, you know, diverse countries. But also, so obviously it makes sense that you want to break the vicious cycle of sleep paralysis early, right? You want to, you know, you know, you prevent this from escalating and getting out, getting out of hand. I, I think that makes, that makes perfect sense. But, but first of all, Let's take a step back and ask ourselves, why do people hallucinate ghosts in the first place? So I've thought about this. My colleague, uh, B.S. Ramachandran and I, you know, he's from UC San Diego. We've thought about like, what is the brain doing, you know, causing you to see these ghosts or causing you to have an out-of-body experience and, ex and see yourself as a ghost? We think that, you know, that the parts of the brain that is responsible for creating a sense of a the land, a sense of me, right? So the part of the brain that's creating that becomes disrupted when we try to move during sleep paralysis and escape the paralysis because there's no feedback from our limbs helping us build a sense of a self, okay? I don't wanna confuse you here, but what's happening when we construct a sense of an eye in the brain, we are sending commands all the time to our bodies and then we rely on commands from the moving arm from A to B in space to tell our brains how to construct a sense of a self, a sense of a balance. But if that you know information is lacking due to the paralysis, well, then you will keep sending paralysis uh, commands during sleep paralysis to move, 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 but you're not sending feedback from the paralyzed body to your brain telling you how to move and how to create a sense of a self. And as a principle in neuroscience that is well known is that the brain hates, abhors, dreads any incongruent situation and likes to fill in these, you know, holes with its own information. And so it hallucinates your damn legs for you. It said, look, your legs are here. If you don't, if you're not moving, then I'll tell you where your legs are, you know, or it will cause you to feel like your sense of self is shifted out in space or, you know, and, and, and so basically this is what we think is going on. And then you project agency and intention into these, these projected, uh, you know, you know, you know, figures of, of yourself in, in effect. So 
This is what we think is going on. Now, here we have this, you know, phenomenon of sleep paralysis where you are sleeping and potentially, you know, you might see ghosts. You might feel like you are, you know, you, you are a ghost yourself. You know, this might be one of the most interesting things in science, right? Where you see ghosts and you feel like you are a ghost and all, of, all the while sleeping. Or you might you know, develop a mental disorder from merely sleeping. You know, so so this tells you how how fascinating this experience and, and, and you know is, and certainly I was I was right in going down this path and studying this. Now I want to end on this note, which I often do during during my lectures. You know, during my own sleep during uh, one of my own sleep paralysis episodes, you know, I have this once in a while. I was in California, I was sleeping, and I realized, my God, I can actually move. I can leave my physical body. So I had a lucid experience on top of my sleep. Uh, you know, paralysis. So I left my uh, physical body during sleep paralysis and as a ghost, as a ghostly body, I walked around in my apartment in California like this, you know, and I thought, look, this is a perfect time for me to do an experiment. You know, as a scientist, I must do something about this. You, I can't just let this opportunity pass by me. So I found this piece of paper on the floor like this and I put it in my, you know, pajamas, my PJs, and I walked towards my physical body and I said, I'm gonna go down to my physical body and I'm gonna wake myself up. And if the paper is still there when I wake up, I had to, I would have to reconsider my own scientific explanations for, for sleep paralysis, in, you know, uh, sleep paralysis ghosts in favor of more uncanny uh, ideas. And, and so I went down to my physical body and I looked at my pajamas. And so the question is, was it there when I woke up, woke up or not? Well, it turns out, unfortunately, it wasn't there, but I still get to joke with my colleagues saying we're a unique group of people who can say we're working while sleeping. Thank you very much.